from the authors of Author Masterminds. This is Mysterious. Mystery surrounds us every day. Join us and listen to true stories of mystery, from human behavior to nature and the physical environment to paranormal experiences. The stories are true, even if we can't explain them. I find idioms interesting. Their origins are a mystery. First of all, some of them sound idiotic, nonsensical. For example, saved by the skin of your teeth. What in the world does that mean? But the word idiom is not related to idiocy. Rather, idiom comes from the Greek word idioma, meaning pre peculiar phrasing. That perfectly describes an idiom. An idiom is a widely used saying or expression containing a figurative meaning that differs from the phrase's literal meaning. Idioms often reflect a commonly held cultural experience, even if that experience is antiquated. For example, you might say that someone should bite the bullet when they need to quit procrastinating and do something they don't want to do. Originally, the phrase referred to wounded soldiers literally biting down on a bullet to avoid screaming during a wartime operation. Thus, the past a phrase we still use today, though it literally does not apply. Welcome to Mysterious. I am Rebecca Wetzler, and I will be your host for this episode. I view myself as a purposeful overcomer through the fruit of faith. I write about how Bible scripture is applicable to our lives today. You may find a description of my first book, Breadbox for the Broken, on Author Mastermind's website, or read my short articles on Readers and Writers Book Club website. You will find links to those sites in the show notes. Let's start with the Good Samaritan. You might be surprised to learn there are more idioms from the Bible than just the well-known Good Samaritan. Or perhaps you don't even realize that the Good Samaritan comes from the Bible. I think it is common knowledge that a Good Samaritan is a person who renders aid in serious or life-threatening situations out of compassion, does not expect payment, such as when people stop to help at car accidents. To encourage people to help without fear of reprisal, Good Samaritan laws have been passed nationwide to provide legal protection for an individual who renders aid to an injured person in an emergency before trained help arrives. These laws apply in situations that are recognized as an emergency, services are voluntary, they are not grossly negligent, and the victim accepts it. Now, if the victim is unresponsive or unconscious, consent is implied. Now, I was surprised to note, however, in some states, you are required to have a CPR certification to be covered by Good Samaritan laws. In most states, witnesses are not required to render aid, but if you have enacted failure to act laws, which require bystanders to provide minimal assistance, such as calling 911. The origin of the Good Samaritan story is in Luke 10, 25-37. An expert in Jewish law was testing Jesus, asking Jesus what he must do to have eternal life. Jesus responded by asking him, what is written in the law? The law expert answered with the two great commandments. First, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and secondly, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus told him he answered correctly. However, the expert further asked, but who is my neighbor? Jesus answered with the Good Samaritan parable. The man going from Jerusalem to Jericho was attacked, stripped, and beaten half to death by robbers. Both a priest and a Levite, the Levi tribe of Israel were assistants to priests, saw the victim and passed on the other side of the road. A Samaritan, however, had pity on the victim, treated him, took him to an inn, and paid for his care until he recovered. 
It is significant that the person who helped was a Samaritan rather than either of the religious Jews who passed by. For centuries, the Jews and Samaritans hated each other based on political and religious difference. Yet Jesus, a Jew, chose the hated Samaritan as the man with compassion. Speaking in Memphis in April 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. shared an inspired explanation of the three passerby's thought processes. He suggested the first question that the priest and Levite asked themselves was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? Conversely, when the Good Samaritan came by, he reversed the question, if I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? The parable of the Good Samaritan, according to Dr. King, teaches us not to worry about possible negative consequences for ourselves or rely on someone else to do the right thing instead of ourselves. We should be willing to take risks in our efforts to help our neighbors, just like the Good Samaritan did. Now to explain by the skin of your teeth that I mentioned in the introduction. Isn't this a strange one? It's understood to mean barely getting through something. For example, it could be barely passing a test or barely making it out of a car accident a lot. It comes from the Old Testament's book of Job. In the beginning of the story, Satan comes before the Lord and God complimented Job's righteous life. Satan counters with Job only served faithfully because God had put a hedge about him, protecting his prosperity. Competent in Job's devotion, God allowed Satan to afflict Job with any number of calamities. In one afternoon, all his children were killed, all his animal stock was stolen, the servants caring for them slaughtered either by invading forces or supernatural means. And not long after that, Job is afflicted with a terrible skin disease, painful boils from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. See Job 2.7. His three friends came to comfort him. However, despite his utter despair and being so afflicted physically they at first could not recognize him, they still lectured him on how he must have brought this upon himself. After many lamentations, accusations, suggested sins, flaring temperatures, ad nauseum, Job pointed out his intolerable physical condition in Job 19.20, saying, I am nothing but skin and bones. I ex have escaped only with the skin of my teeth. And he asked his friends for pity. Biblical scholars are still unclear what exactly Job meant by the phrase. The simple interpretation suggests Job's suffering left him just skin and bones, covered in boils, and perhaps only his gums, the skin on his teeth, were free of boils, or he was referring to his lips, the skin over his teeth. Whatever the literal meaning of his phrase at the time, the underlying implication is he was barely making it. After the long conversation with his unhelpful friends, the Lord spoke to them. He rebuked Job for forgetting God as sovereign and infinitely wiser, where man is limited in ability and wisdom. However, since Job held on to his reverence for God, despite his unjust suffering, the Lord restored what had been lost and then some. Something to remember, even when we are facing our most difficult circumstances or seemingly impossible odds, if we hold on to our faith in God, we will persevere. Now let's look at the writing on the wall. The writing on the wall has been used as a proverbial omen of misfortune since the early 18th century. It comes from the Old Testament story of the Babylonian King Belshazzar's feast, a grand banquet he hosted for a thousand of his lords out of arrogance despite the city being under siege from the Persians. He ordered the valuable holy vessels looted from Solomon's temple to be brought in for use during the feast, using the sacred items grossly blasphemed against the holiness of God. As recounted in the book of Daniel, chapter 5, verses 1 through 31, in the middle of the feast, a ghostly disembodied hand appeared behind the king and wrote on the wall, Mene, Mene, Tekel, a parson. 
I probably didn't pronounce any of that right. When he nor his wise men nor the enchanters could interpret the text, the words are literally a list of different Hebrew measurements. King Belshazzar called on the prophet Daniel, who explained that the message meant the king's kingdom had been numbered, weighed, and divided. In other words, Belshazzar's days as king were numbered because he was weighed and found unfit, and that very night his kingdom would be divided. As foretold, that night King Belshazzar was killed, and the Babylon and Babylon was claimed by the Persians and the Medes. Fulfillment of God's judgment against the arrogant and godless ruler was swiftly completed. Let me take a short break. Mysterious is sponsored by Author Masterminds and Readers and Writers Book Club. We invite you to join the club where you can chat with Author Masterminds, read free content pieces and serialized books, and buy books at 50% off the list price. Please check the podcast show notes for the links to both websites. The idiom wash your hands of a matter was first said by a Roman governor. People use this phrase when fed up with something. You're done with an issue and will take no further responsibility for it. In other words, you wash your hands of the matter. Its origin was during one of the most defining pivotal events in world history. In the New Testament, Matthew chapter 6, 26 and 27 tell the story of Jesus' arrest, the Sanhedrin's bogus trial, Pilate's unsuccessful attempts to free Jesus, and the ultimate condemnation to the cross when Pilate turned Jesus over to the angry Jewish crowd. Pilate figured out that this was all about the Jewish religious envy and continued to ask the crowd to release Jesus. Meanwhile, his wife had troublesome dreams about it, so insisted he have nothing to do with condemning Jesus. The Jews claimed their law was broken when Jesus proclaimed he was the Son of God, at which Pilate became even more frightened to condemn Jesus. However, once the crowd accused Pilate of not being a friend of Caesar's if he freed Jesus, given they claimed his teachings stirred up trouble and he was opposed to paying taxes, which was not true, Pilate essentially had to give in. Matthew twenty-seven twenty-four says, When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. After Pilate proclaimed he was innocent of Jesus' blood, the Jews were responsible for deciding to crucify him. He turned Jesus over to the angry crowd. The Jewish religious leaders, their lies accomplished their murderous goal. Wolf and sheep's clothing can be linked to both ancient folklore and biblical teaching. A wolf in sheep's clothing is an enemy disguised as a friend or a dangerous person pretending to be harmless. This concept has two common, commonly accepted origins. One is from the ancient writings called Aesop's Fables, thought to appear in the 6th century BC. In one of the fables, a wolf disguised himself as a sheep so that he could easily sneak up on them and eat them. However, the shepherd also collected sheep to eat for his evening dinner, and one night he killed the wolf thinking it was a sheep. So the moral of the story is the deception was the enemy's demise. The other accepted origin is from the Bible. Matthew seven fifteen to 16 says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. This is how the Jewish religious leaders behaved towards Jesus. They would ask him questions based on the scriptures with the plan to trip him up and call him blasphemous. Jesus' answers were always correct. He proved he is the Savior by showing them in the scriptures where he fulfilled all the prophecies about the coming Messiah. However, they intended to maintain their religious and legal power no matter what, even if it meant denying the most important prophetic fulfillment of all time. (music) 
Let's move on to a drop in the bucket. A drop in the bucket means a small, inadequate quantity or an insignificant contribution towards a larger issue. You may also hear it expressed as a drop in the ocean. For example, although we are grateful for all the donations received, the total raised so far is just a drop in the bucket for what is needed. The origin is in Isaiah 40, where Isaiah prophesied about future appearance of John the Baptist in Jesus Christ, and he also declared that God is all-powerful. Nothing is his equal. Verse 15 says, Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they are fine dust. Consider to God the power of the nations are a drop in the bucket. Ultimately, they are weighed as nothing but dust compared to God's all-encompassing power through infinity. In other words, they are ultimately inadequate and significant. Of course, it's hard for us to comprehend this when we are significantly affected within finite time and worldly ruling powers around us. Speaking of powers, next is the origin of the powers that be. The powers that be refers to the established government or particular authority that is in control of something, may be considered faceless, and often wields its power unreasonably. For example, the powers that be stop the impromptu celebration. The phrase is derived from Romans 13.1, Let every soul be subject unto higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained by God. The context is Paul telling Christ's followers that they still need to submit to governing authorities because God allowed them to be in power. Submitting was often onerous because both Jewish relig religious leaders and Romans persecuted Christians mercilessly. Modern populaces can often feel the same way about authorities, having to submit to even unreasonable or nonsensical rules. Now we have the fly in the ointment explanation. Fly in the ointment has a brief origin story. Its meaning refers to a small but irritating flaw that spoils the whole or delays progress. An example is the consensus of the doctors was to proceed with the new treatment. However, the fly in the ointment was waiting for the insurance approval. In earlier times, ointments were creams or oils with medicinal, cosmetic, or ceremonial use. In Ecclesiastes, the book on contemplative wisdom, verses 10-1, says dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. While the word savor nowadays con connotes something very pleasant, such as dwelling on enjoying a good dessert completely, in earlier centuries it strangely could also mean the opposite, have a suggestion or trace of something bad, such as its use in this verse. Now imagine using a cosmetic ointment in the Middle Ages made by a careless apothecary which is an archaic word for pharmacist, and you realize you are unexpectedly spreading gooey dead fly parts across your face. But then people even today think mud baths are, have beauty benefits, but I'll pass on that too. Bite the dust is our next curious idiom, also with a brief origin history. To bite the dust means to fail or to die. Examples are, I think my washing machine has finally bit the dust, or sadly, many small businesses bit the dust during the COVID pandemic. Its origin is from Psalm 72, a psalm about how a king should rule with justice and righteousness. It is a prayer for a king's success. In verse 9, it says, May the desert tribes bow before him and his enemies lick the dust. In other words, let a good king's subjects honor him and his enemies fail. However, most people are more likely familiar with the hard rock band Queen's Song, Another One Bites the Dust. I like many of Queen's songs, though I mostly do not like the head-banging hard rock, which I call headache music. You know how you like songs but don't really know the words? All this time I haven't understood some of the words in this song, so I just mumble through those parts when I sing along. Hard rock can be difficult to understand, so out of curiosity, I finally looked up the lyrics in preparation for this podcast. I now know that some of the lyrics I completely didn't understand are, 
Out of the doorway, the bullets rip to the sound of the beat. Yeah. So I just learned this song is about shootouts. Huh. Had no idea. Actually, I'm not sure what I thought the song was about, except the clue in the idiom, something failed. So it is befitting with our phrase, isn't it? This one is most likely more well-known than the Good Samaritan. And advice every one of us should follow. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This phrase is a timeless, priceless mes message. Jesus spoke it in his Sermon on the Mount. Matthew seven twelve says, So in everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. The phrase is commonly known as the golden rule. In a sermon described in Luke 6, Jesus repeats it when teaching about loving your enemies. Verse 31 quotes, do to others as you would have them do to you. The phrase succinctly encompasses ethical and moral tenets for just conduct, even towards the ungrateful or the enemy. We can also note that early philosophers Confucius and Epicurus had similar versions of this rule. The Chinese sage Confucius said, what you do not wish upon yourself, extend not to others. And the Greek philosopher Epicurus defined justice as an agreement, neither to harm nor be harmed. My final idiom is heard it through the grapevine. While this podcast has been about idioms from the Bible, I can't finish talking about idioms without mentioning my favorite, though it is not from the Bible. And the reason it is my favorite is not for a reason you might think. Heard it through the grapevine is understood to mean learning something through unofficial channels or simply through gossip. Its historical origin was from the time of the Underground Railroad. The grapevine was the Underground Railroad's communication system per se, where people passed on secretive messages by word of mouth. More detailed theories speculate actual grapevines may have substituted for rope to string a clothesline on which hanging different colored clothes could covertly communicate more information, leading to an alternative nickname of clothesline telegraph. During the Civil War, the Underground Railroad dry grapevine was useful and reliable for the Union Army, in addition to soldiers passing verbal communications through the ranks. The phrase further evolved with the invention of the telegraph system. Its wires swooped and draped in random twisted patterns from poles and trees for miles, suggesting a great tangle of grapevines. While this is interesting history, it is not why the phrase is my prim primarily my favorite. I just love the Motown song named Heard It Through the Grapevine. In 1967, Gladys Knight and the Pips successfully released the gospel-influenced soul-sounding recording. The next year, Marvin Gaye's recorded version was released, and it instantly became even more successful given his distinctive voice with its Motown sound, thrumming bass, and soulful anguish. The coup de grace for me, though, cementing it as my favorite, when the California Raisins sang it for commercials. I thought that was so clever. You need to listen to it. Find it on YouTube. There are links in the show notes to both the Marvin Gaye version and one with the California Raisins. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to subscribe. Remember to take a look at the show notes for links to Author Masterminds, Readers and Writers Book Club, and the links I referenced during this podcast. There are also links to my social media. Again, please subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast so you don't miss a single episode of Mysterious, where my fellow authors and I explore mysteries in the world around.